Welcome to Crossroads. I'm your host, Joshua Phillip. Today we have with us Perry Gothier with Capital Ministries. We're going to talk about separation of church and state and what that used to mean and how it's being twisted around to mean something very different today. And so, real pleasure having you on yes, the show. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you very yes. much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for what you're doing. Oh, thank you also. So, tell us a bit about, I guess, your work and what you do, and then we'll get into kind of the yes. topic. You bet. Yes. In Capital Ministries, we're making disciples of Christ in the political arena. So we're, we're missionary, pastoral, evangelist, Bible teachers. So we're not lobbyists or lawyers uh, trying to affect the political world for policy per se. We, we know law is very valuable, uh, but we don't do that. We try to sneak in the back door and we try to affect the hearts. One of our slogans is changing hearts to change a nation. Another slogan we have is if the hearts are right, the laws will be right. So we try, uh, we know that there's a political end in our mission field is the political realm, but we don't approach it in typical political ways. We approach it as ministers, as spiritual servants, as pastors trying to love these people right where they are. I tell people, uh, senators are people too. <laughs> they've got hearts, they've got real problems. So you gotta love on them, you gotta care about them as, as pastors. But then we have a biblical ethic, a truth that we want to give them. It'll help their personal life and it'll help their public life and their public service. Okay, so we're talking now about two, two different arenas. There is the inner realm of your values, your morals, your beliefs, and the things that guide what you believe is right and wrong in life and what is best for you in terms of your own happiness. Yes. That is a domain that politics was never meant to touch. Mm. And I think, in my understanding, that was part of the idea of separation of church and state. Also, it was because things like the Catholic Church did become governing bodies, and it, it, yes. did, it did affect it in some ways. And I think we wanted to avoid that happening in the U.S. Right, yes. And so I think it goes two ways. And I, I know that you, you probably get accused of, you know, pushing that line yeah. accusation. Do you what, what do you tell people who feel that yeah. way? Yeah, being accused of wanting a theocracy, for example. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, this is what people, yeah. I'm sure you probably get people telling that. Yes, they do. Yes. Yeah, they do. You know, we just say that we believe that the separation of church and state, the way it was intended in the founding of our country, was basically to not, when the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law establishing a religion, in context, that means a Christian religion. Because America was 96.4% Protestant, 1.2% Catholic, 99.6% Christian, at least in profession. That's just the, who we were, at least by profession. Um, so in that context, what they're saying in the First Amendment is Congress shall make no law creating a theocracy in the sense that, like the Anglican church over in England, <laughs> that we won't have a forced Anglicanism on the entire country. So they, they fled for religious freedom. So the separation of church and state was, in a, as expressed in the First Amendment, is only about that. There won't be like the United States as a Presbyterian nation, for example, or Catholic or, you know, or, or Episcopalian. Uh, so that freedom is meant to be there. So as far as being accused to want to set up a, the a theocracy, we don't because in Capital Ministries we teach that there's five separate institutions through which God has delegated divine power onto the earth. There's church and state, there's marriage and family, and there's commerce. Each of these have a, f a beautiful design by God to do something unique in culture. Well, uh, the church and state are two separate institutions the church is to evangelize the world, to tell the good news of God's love, his ethics as expressed in the scriptures. But the state is to enforce and in a sense force a certain morality. George Washington said in one word, uh, the definition of government is force. So we want to keep these two institutions separate because God has designed them to be separate. So institutionally separate with different roles, so we're clear about that and we teach that. We teach our senators, our lawmakers, you keep those separate. One senator said, they got to play in their own sandbox, right? I said, yes, sir. But they're not influentially separate. The church and people of faith have always, uh, it's only normal for people with their worldview to try to inject that into the political realm. I like to say, uh, your ethics will, whether you, unless you're a hypocrite, your ethics will percolate up and percolate into your political view. 
So you go to Afghanistan with the Quran, etc. It's normal for those people to have a Quranic uh, Islamic ethic bubble up into Sharia constitution. What's that? That's a law. So that really is quite consistent. The question is whose worldview? And yeah. so, and we have freedom to discuss different worldviews, but that's kind of how we. And see. this is this is an important discussion. So what you're talking about is something that's rooted in traditional law and traditional government and the way societies are structured. Yes. If we go back into more ancient times, you talked about the divine hierarchy. Right. The belief that there is a tier of how morals stretch and order stretches into the human world. Okay. And so they talked about heaven, right? God, the order of angels, the different mm -hmm. levels of heaven. Right. Down into kings, down into, you know, lords, down into knights, right. down into you know, families and or businesses and then families and then, you know, fathers and mothers right. and children. Right. The idea that more morality, right, the guiding morality uh, comes from heaven and stretches down into the human world to the, to, to, through all levels, right? right? And it was that that idea that, that created, I think, the, the separation between government and higher law, higher okay. principle. Okay. The idea that government is not higher than morals, the idea right. that government is not higher than uh, yes. than law itself, like that. right? That law is instituted in defense of morals mm -hmm. in a certain way, and I, th I think you know, as a society, we've had trouble with that because we've had people who don't believe in morals come about, <laughs> right. and people who don't believe in anything come about, and yes. people who very actively want to destroy these things come about, such yes. as with you know communism. They talk about in the Communist Manifesto: communism destroys all religion and all morality. Yes. And yes. so there, there is a very strong battle of ideology and battle of values in our world today. And yes. under, under the communist ideology, for example, which is you know, still playing a very large influence through socialism, yes. you know, of course, you had institutions that tried to stamp out religious belief. In China, for example, they had the Cultural Revolution, which destroyed, uh, you know, killed priests, killed monks, yes. killed uh, Taoists. Uh, Oh, yes. and created new forms of those religions under state control. You had the China Buddha Association, for example, and different associations for every religion, wow. which said you cannot recognize a power higher than the government. And I think that's what we're seeing now, is there are people, there are a lot of people who believe government is the highest power yes. in the land, rather yes. than a morality yes. which is above government. Yes, amen. And, and when people yeah. believe in a morality higher than government, they believe in a stable, unchanging morality. Yes. Whereas government can change morality as it sees fit, yes. depending on whatever social issue wants to push at any moment. Right. <laughs> and so this this is a, a very difficult environment, I'm sure, for people in your position, yes. where you're coming from the moral <laughs> stance and talking to people in government who are yes. dealing with this very live conflict. Oh yes, absolutely. I remember a senator years ago um, said, "You know, Perry, I just struggle with coming to a." Uh, study the scriptures with fellow senators and yourself as a pastor in the state house here. Um, I want to keep my my faith separate from my legislation. It's it was so, and of course I respected his opinion and um, his desires. Uh, it's interesting though, year after year while he was in office, I watched him see it, it was really unavoidable. You cannot unless you're just going to uh, you know ratchet it down and and deny what you really believe, you really cannot let your morals and ethics not affect your legislation. Well, and, and that goes both ways. It, it's whether yes, you, even if you believe in nothing, your belief in nothing, right, affect, yes. affects what you what you believe in when it comes to policy. Yes. I mean, abortion is a great example. It is. It, it is not a policy issue, it's a moral issue. It is and indeed. there are people, it, it goes down to whether or not you believe there's a soul. Yes. Whether or not you believe that, you know, an in, killing an infant is, yes. you know, murder or whether it's just the clump of cells like yes. atheists yes. might believe. And yes. so this, this is a moral issue. Absolutely. And, and a, lot of, a lot of issues in our society are moral issues, even though yes. they're not painted as such. Yes. Good point. Yeah, and the painting is a key word. It, it's really about presentation. And I know when Lieutenant Governor being in Texas here, as we sit, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said with the shootings down in El Paso, he says, let's just call it what it is. It's evil. And then uh, Governor Greg Abbott said about a week ago, he says, the problem is not guns. The problem is hearts without God. Well, so there's a moral and a spiritual complexion. Ideas have consequences. 
and really that's what morals are. It's just the whose idea of right and wrong, good and bad, that's morals and ethics. It's there, it's unescapable. I've got an atheist friend in my hometown and I say, you have a belief system, you have a God. I told you I'm not a theist. No, I didn't say you're a theist. I said you have something you value highly and it's science and the logic that you can fit into your two by four brain and you're a smart guy but to you at science, that's what you value highest. I'm really trying to listen to you. But to me, if, if God with a small g, uh, you know, in philosophy, God is defined as that, that being greater than which nothing can be conceived. Okay, let's, let's work with that definition. You as my atheist friend, I think you have something you value highly. It's that and that, and that is gonna affect, that's your morality, my friend, and you're welcome to it. I'm just trying to share you, with you my ideas, and I'm coming from a, a biblical base as a scriptural Christian, as an ordained minister. And you don't have to be. I'm just trying to talk to you here. And I think all these ideas have consequences. And it's so true in, in the political realm. And yeah. people you know, think it's not. It's well, not. really, I mean, when it, it's, it's, this, is, this is at the heart of all of our political debates when it comes down to it. It's different people of different values doing what they believe is right based on yes. their values and fighting very sometimes viciously yeah, over right, what they right, believe right. is right based on their yeah, values. Yeah. But you know, in the past, I think it was better understood. There, there was a great, you know, you mentioned school shootings. Yes. There's a great case that, well, I mean, a terrible case, I should right. say, which is often forgotten about, which was one of the first cases like this, and that was Leopold versus Loeb. Mm, okay. And what happened was, is you had two extremely well-educated, you know, kids, teenagers, yes who decided one day to create, commit the perfect crime. And they kidnapped one of the kid's younger cousins. They raped him, they murdered him, and they hid his body in the woods, and they dumped lime on his body, and they left it. And basically, there, was, there would be no way they could have traced it to them, but one of the kids dropped his glasses on the way out. And he had a very rare prescription, and they found it and traced it back to him. Oh my. And when these kids got, you know, were put on trial, it started a real conversation in society. Mm. And it was, it was one of how could kids, how could very well-educated kids, with all, the, with all the faculties of reason, right. with all the faculties of logic Smart and all kids. the faculties of science, commit such an atrocious act? And they said, well, they're taught that there is no God. They're taught that there's no such thing as morals. Yes. A person like this, why should they care whether they commit good or evil if they don't believe in good and evil? Yes. And that, that was an interesting point that I, it, it was an interesting debate that I think society just never really properly had. Yes. Is what, what kind of people are we creating when yes. the ideas of morality itself, whether is murder bad, is, is stealing bad, is, yeah. are, the, you know, are things that affect <laughs> exactly. the, the joy of others, right? If, if it benefits you, should they be considered good or evil? Right. And this, this, is, this is really, um, even when you get into things like socialism, is it, is it right to steal something from another person if right. you, if you yeah. want what they have? Yeah, is what it, is that? Is it, is it, <laughs> in, in, you know, is, you, know it, you get into all kinds of debates about this, but really the, the morals of society and how they affect action, oh, yeah. this is an important part of our lives oh, yeah. that is not really being talked about properly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, well, here at the ALEC Convention, you know, a belief in free markets, et cetera, taught a a, a series to my senators in Nebraska about 10 years ago, and it was biblical economics. And I had no intention to start with the Ten Commandments, but I and I can't remember why I did. I was going to talk about what the Proverbs say about money and things like that. I started with the Ten Commandments. I ended up doing 10 weeks on the Ten Commandments, showing the economic implications of each of them, and then uh, came across, you know, Thou shalt not steal, one of the big ten. and. Um, and I found it interesting that America, with a, a Christian-based founding father system, et cetera, and based on the Ten Commandments, you know, there's 52 images of the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court, like 51 on the floor and like one on the, the great oak doors. Um, so this is part of the fabric of, of what America is. So thou shalt not steal. You think? <laughs> okay, good. sounds like a good idea to most of humanity, right? But if your ethics are not that, I can contrasted that with to my senators with this truth that Karl Marx said, the essence, and he should know, the essence of communism and socialism is, in a sentence, elimination of private property. Okay, so if there is, 
thou shalt not steal implies ownership. And if the essence of this atheistic system, which goes to socialism with the goal of communism, is none of that, none of this, you see how the ethics so greatly inform the economic system. Because if there's no stealing, if there's no God, if there's no, if the government is God in an atheistic system, it is. So I say that the state without the church is doomed because it will worship itself, it will grow until it bursts because it's inadequate as an institution of the five institutions of God, it's inadequate to create and fulfill all ethical truth. And that's the role of spirituality and religion in the world. So they must be coadjuvants, they must work together in society, and, but, but the best societies are those that have the best ethics infusing the institution of state. So, so not really a separation. <laughs> yeah, great. And I know, I know that, I guess, maybe last point is that you, you get a lot of pressure and I think there's kind of a, ironically, a suppression of religion in this country right now. Yes. Where it's, it's okay to have no morals, right. but if you yeah. want to say, I don't believe in that, I don't support exactly. that, you are considered a bad guy. Exactly. And this, this is where, and ironically, government really is starting to get into the, you know, breaking the barrier of separation of church and state, where yes. they're saying that you cannot say you don't support this. Yes, exactly. You cannot say you don't, you, that you, your morals oppose this. Yes. And when it comes, and then at the same time, they're, you know, trying to press into institutions and saying you yes. can, you know, religious institutions saying you can no longer teach this. Yeah. You know, and I think we're heading in a very dangerous direction it with this. And I, what are your thoughts are being on kind of the front lines of this? Yes, yeah, it's dangerous indeed. Really, it's a form of theocracy. It's a anti-God, an atheistic, if you want to call secular humanism, uh, secular means time or the second. So the secularist is all about time. His shoes are nailed to the floor and there's no lights coming in the upper story. There's no divine. It's all about right now, says the secularist. So secular humanism, focusing on me, the mighty human, in time, this is all there is. With that flow, which feeds into an atheism and an arrogance, um, well, if government is adopting that as the official religion, because again, the cultural um, flow and ethic that's bubbling most in any given culture will come up into the government. And the government kind of does, in a sense, almost is natural to, almost has to, turn it into law. So because this atheistic, humanistic godlessness, it's rejecting the great morals of really all world religions have um, many of the great moral ethics intact. They're very similar. Um, so, uh, but in America, we're at a scary place indeed because what it's becoming is a forced theocracy. Well, I'm not a theist. Well, well, yeah, but you believe in some little g God and theos is just the, uh, the Greek spelling of God. It is a theocracy. Kratos means power. Theokratos, God is power. So a theocracy is when church equals state, when the two institutions meld and so like you know, in state, Germany. And state enforces it then. Yes, yes. yep, state enforcing, and it doesn't allow uh, freedom of religion, which is key in our country. And so even though, the, as I said, 99.6% of America's foundings were at least what we'd call professing Christians, there was still freedom of religion. Why? Because that's a Christian idea. To, to let people respectfully Talk and think, come let us reason together, Isaiah 118. Let people think and talk respectfully. Now, not a lot of people know that one of our founding fathers was a Muslim. I didn't know that either. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, hmm. I'm not thinking of his name. I'll email it to you. Yeah. Uh, but over time, because freedom of religion is a Christian idea, that we tolerate. You try to go to some countries with get your freedom of religion. Oh no, you will be shut down. You might be killed. But here there is that freedom. Well, here's the neat story about that Muslim person. It's neat to me as a Christian minister, that over time, through respectful conversation and debate, let the debate begin. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, the Christian apologist, used to say, all we want in Christianity is a level playing field. That's all we want. And we'll just talk and we'll think and we'll reason together as respectful human beings. So this Muslim eventually came to Christ.
so which warms my heart as a Christian. And I love Muslim people, but I'm not of that ideological worldview. Uh, but to me, how interesting that in, a, that in basically a Christian-based country, there's freedom of religion. And uh, so, and that is also with the scariness of the current times as we get farther and farther from true religion, true, solid, sound, proven ethics that cause cultures to flourish. Um, I, one of my sayings is that uh, I, in Nebraska we have a unicameral, but the members of the unicameral are called senators. So I developed a uh, saying for them. I said, senators, did you know that civil servants are societal saviors, sort of? <laughs> <laughs> and I say, now I'm an ordained minister, so I'm not saying you replace, you know, Christ on the cross. You know, he's, he gives personal salvation from individual sin. I'm not saying that, of course, you know what? That would uh, not be true or right. But you know what? You are. If you do your work right in the institution of state, you will, in a sense, save society. What's the difference between North Korea and South Korea? Atheism and, and uh, non-atheism. Well, you look at night at the aerial photograph, I'm sure you've seen. It's black, it's cold, the shelves are empty, the people are in grinding oppression. But where there's freedom of religion and freedom of thought, and including Christianity, that is lit at night. And I think it's just graphic to the reality of the governments. Frank Turek, a Christian apologist, says the only difference between the two is the government. So who's a societal savior, sort of? The South Korean government. Now, what are the ethics behind it? What is the worldview and the religion that is percolating up to produce these? It matters. Ideas have consequences, and value and ethics, that's where it's at. Great. So, so where can people learn more about your organization? Well, thank you for asking. Yes, Capital Ministries is our organization. www.capmin.org is our website, and uh, we're a worldwide ministry, and uh, capmin.org, C-A-P-M-I-N.org. Great. Hey, real pleasure having oh, you. Oh, you too. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Everyone, thanks again. Please remember to like and subscribe. See you next time. Thank you.